Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Allison Bainbridge, and I am really excited to host Book Passage's author event this evening because I think it will be delightful and fun. We all need fun these days. Um, there's a lot of things that are not fun. So please grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and sit back and enjoy the conversation. The book at the heart of the conversation is Pigeon Watching, Getting to Know the World's Most Misunderstood Bird. There we go. Kira's holding that up. It is part field guide, part history, part ornithology primer, and altogether fun. There you go, fun again. Um, fact, pigeons are amazing, and until recently, humans adored them. We've kept them as pets, held pigeon beauty contests, raced them, used them to carry messages over battlefields, harvested their poop to fertilize our crops, etc. Now, with the pocket guide to pigeon watching, readers can rediscover the wonder, equal parts illustrative field guide and quirky history. It covers behavior, why they coo, how they flock, how they preen, um, and so much more. Uh, anatomy and identification from Birmingham Roller to the American Giant Runt to the Scandaroon. Birder issues like what to do if you find a baby pigeon stranded in the park. Um, there are so many names that we call them, for instance, rats with wings. Think again. I, ha I actually happen to be one of those people who doesn't mind pigeons. In fact, I actually enjoy watching them when I visit a city like New York. Um, however, that could be perhaps because I don't live in New York. So when I'm there, they are part of the ambiance, but I find them interesting. Um, pigeons coo, peck and nest all over the world, yet most of us treat them with indifference or disdain. So Rosemary Mosco, a bird lover, science communicator, writer and cartoonist and co-author of the Atlas Obscura's Explorer's Guide for the World's Most Adventurous Kid is here to give the pigeon's image a makeover and to help every town and city dweller get closer to nature by discovering the joys of birding through pigeon watching. Her Bird and Moon Nature comics were the subject of an award-winning museum exhibit and are collected in a book that's a 2019 ALA graphic, great graphic novel for teens. She also writes for Audubon and the PBS kids show Eleanor Wonders Why. Rosemary is a beloved speaker at birding festivals. Here to talk about all things pigeon with her is author Kira Jane Buxton. Her writings appeared in the New York Times, McSweeney's, The Rumpus, Huffington Post, and more. Her debut novel, Hollow Kingdom, was an indie next pick, a finalist for the Third Prize, many more awards, and was named the best book of 2019 by NPR. If you haven't read it and you are a bird lover, even if you're not a bird lover. I truly recommend it. It's a wonderful book. She calls the tropical utopia of Seattle home. I love that. And spends her time with three cats, a dog, two crows, a charm of hummingbirds, five stellar jays, two dark-eyed juncos, two squirrels, and a husband. Please welcome virtually War Rosemary Mosco and Kira Jane Buxton. Hi, I, I hope those birds are listed in order of importance and then the husband is the yes. afterthought. Entirely <laughs> how it was done, yeah. Uh, My only regret about that, other than that the number of animals has grown, is that, um, yeah, I uh, <laughs> I feel like it's a mouthful for any poor bookseller to try. <laughs> Especially the Junko part, that's always... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Hi, how are you? Hi, good. I am so excited to talk to you. I feel like I just did one of these for your recent book, Feral Creatures, which is absolutely wonderful. So it's it's cool to return the favor and or or have the favor returned. So, oh my gosh. It's yeah, uh, I'm, I'm I've been so, so looking forward to this. I'm so obsessed uh with a pocket guide to pigeon watching. I and I knew I would be, um, because I'm such a fan of yours, as you know. Um, but there's so much to love about it. Like I one of the things that I love the most is that I feel like birding can sometimes be a little bit um difficult to to get into or sometimes you know there's a there can be a little bit of a superciliousness to you know uh the birding community sometimes and this book is all about birding is for everyone to enjoy and birds are for everyone to enjoy and it's it's just sort of this lovely 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 guide um also it is about a bird that's so maligned you know the pigeon has a terrible reputation <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, rats with wings was was what, how they were just described. Um, so I love that. I mean, I defy anyone to read it and not feel that, you know, that they could, you know, go from disdain to affection, which is, I think, a gift and something that I'm interested in my own writing. I always pick malign animals as well. Um, it's funny. It's informative. And you know, reading through it, I was floored by how much I don't know about pigeons. And I, you know, now I feel like, okay, I get it. I get it. Pigeons. <laughs> and maybe your next book can have pigeons in it. This is, I, yeah, I did realize that the, the Hollow Kingdom is definitely low on pigeons. Um, much, you know, much to my chagrin learning that. Um, so let's start with, you know, the fact that this is, you know, it's, it's full of the most beautiful illustrations that you do. You have a very iconic style. How did you get started with, how did you find your way to art and illustration? That's funny because that to me is more of a secondary thing. So I'm trained as a science writer um, and as a science communicator, but I just drew my whole life. And Mm -hmm. so I'm really, really, really self-taught. I've done a little bit of learning in terms of, like I took an oil painting class. I used to make art for video games, like pixel art. Like it's it's really, really random what I've learned. And I guess I got my start in like web comics in I guess 2004, 2005-ish, which was kind of a cool time because everyone was just sort of experimenting with this new medium and you didn't have to be, you know, a brilliant artist. You were, it was really just about exploring and communicating fun stuff. So that was kind of an unintimidating world to get started in. But boy, I mean, this was a challenge. I've never, usually I get uh, other illustrators to illustrate my work and it's wonderful. And I just sit back and it comes <laughs> in and it's beautiful. And so I have a new appreciation for that because I think I drew like 150, 160 pigeons for this or something like that. I lost count, but it was a lot. It was a lot. So yeah. <laughs> thanks for the kind words. Cause woof, it was like, a oh, huge no, loss of pigeons. yeah, yeah. And, and, and hysterical, the, the actual pigeon illustrations are so sweet and funny and endearing. Um, I feel like that's part of, you know, the joy of this book is that it's just, it's hysterical. Um, so when you said you started with, with web comics, where was that? With what medium, where, where did you start? Yeah, that was, um, so I have a, a website called birdandmoon.com and it's named after the very first cartoon that I did. So really I just bought the domain and I thought, oh, I'll never do something else. This is perfect. I'll buy this domain. And so now people get really confused because they think like, what is bird and moon? Who is bird? Who is moon? Like it's, it's one of those domains. <laughs> like I sort of wish we didn't have branding as much back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Halcyon days of 2004. But uh, yeah, I was literally just, drawing hand drawing with pen and ink this cartoon about this lonely bird that um meets the moon and they fly around the city and it's feeling very lost and alone in the city which it's funny because you and I are so on the same wavelength (laughs) like it's just so that same kind of story so right at right away for me it was urban birds trying to find their place and that was more like a long form story but um but yeah it got some nice reception back then and then I've just been continuing but with more of a science bent I got a science graduate degree in the middle. So that's sort of like added right. to the, the knowledge base. And right. So it was organic, this sort of blending of humor and, um, and science writing. And yeah. Yeah. Organic is a nice way of saying I wandered around <laughs> reaching out vaguely until I found purchase on something. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, why pigeons? What was the, what was the, how long has this love affair with pigeons been going on? What was the spark? I I really enjoy telling people, oh yeah, I'm writing a book about pigeons and then see how they respond because like 90% of the time it's like, okay, why? Yeah. (laughs) So yeah. yeah. yeah, And it's a totally reasonable question. I'm hoping people will pick up this book going, oh, why? And then, you know, I'll, I'll secretly convince them. Um, but yeah, I've, I grew up living in all sorts of cities. I mean, I lived in Toronto and I I grew up in Canada. So Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, Kingston, a whole bunch of different cities. And I've lived in the States too. And, um, being in all of these cities and being a bird watcher, you notice the pigeons. So I think I, I always kind of liked them, especially because I saw them as an underdog and I was a nerdy bird watching kid who was also kind of an underdog and, 
um, I sort of identified with them, but it wasn't until more recently when I was studying science and looking at how, kind of how our environments change over time that I realized the history that they had. And suddenly I realized like this story is bigger than, than I thought for sure. And, and how incredibly misunderstood they are. Yeah. So yeah, I think that are, was the journey. Yeah. So many people are terrified of them, you know, absolutely terrified of the particular, you, you beautifully sort of explain pigeon flight in the book in a re- in a way I had no, I really didn't know that, that they had this particular method of flying. Um, and that sort of the noises they make that, that terrifies so many people. Yeah. Or grosses them out too. I yeah. mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really interesting. It's because it's so recent, like it really, um, so pigeons were domesticated. We don't know when, but at least 5,000 years ago, um, we're literally, we're bumping up against the dawn of recorded writing. So it yeah, happened yeah. at some point there between agriculture, which was Middle Eastern agriculture, which was maybe 12,000 years ago. And, you know, about 5,000 years ago, when we start to see them in um, in the written record. So we've had a really long relationship with them. And it's really been only in the last few decades that this hatred has solidified in this way, um, which is shocking to me because we all feel like, oh, they've always been sort of gross. But no, 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 they were cool up until recently. And then they yeah. rapidly became uncool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, alas. And because they, you know, you talk a lot also about the 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 care people took with them, and they, that they were, you know, basically these the pets for the privileged, right? They were it was a a hobby to have a dove coat and to you know have your particular pigeons and yeah, they were they were Ferraris of yeah of the animal world. Yeah, they, I mean, rich people had them. So I, I love um, I love learning about um, the Mughal Emperor uh, Akbar the Great who would intimidate, you know, potential ambassadors and and rivals and stuff with his pigeons. So like he loved his (laughs) pigeons and and people would come for, you know, fancy meetings and he would launch his pigeons to do these spectacular flights, you know, immediately upon these people's arrival to like strike them dumb, you know, and intimidate the heck out of them so that then they would be more pliable, like it was diplomacy, which is really, (laughs) really wild. And like, you know, in, in France and England for a while, only the rich were allowed to have pigeons. And so when the French revolution came, one of the first things that the, the elites did was hastily make it legal for poor people to have pigeons because the poor people had started smashing the, the dovecoats, the pigeon houses of the rich out of rage that they were not allowed to have pigeons. Like it's, it's such a, such a flip side to what we have now. It's yeah. it's yeah, a, it's incredible. Rich to rag story, isn't it? It's a yeah, they yeah. plummeted in estimation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah. And this this whole idea that people think they're dirty as well, which is not the case. Yeah, so so like I feel like their fall from grace was kind of a like there it, it was a two-pronged thing. So they they became obsolete. Um, we stopped eating them. We started eating chicken. We stopped using their poop for fertilizer. We started using chemical fertilizer. We stopped using them to carry messages. We developed radio and the internet, whatever. But yeah, at the yeah. same time, they got blamed for all sorts of social ills and for disease in the 1960s in New York, which they didn't really carry. And, and I was surprised to see that they don't get people sick very much at all, like in rare cases they can, you know, just like any other animal, but it's been hugely overblown. They're really not very dirty. They can't really give us bird flu very much. You know, they can't give us rabies. Like they're really not a big issue. You know, I would be more nervous about getting like scratched or bitten by a cat or something like that. No shade to cats, but like (laughs) related to humans. They deserve it. (laughs) But yeah. you're right. That was something that really surprised me. I had suspected, you know, especially given this whole rats with wings reputation, that there would be more of a sort of transference of diseases between our species and pigeons. Not the case. Yeah. And with their fastidious preening as well. They're they're pretty generally clean, except for the poop nests, which. <laughs> yeah. The, so the poop. I like, I totally think it's fair if you don't want your, your balcony encrusted with pigeon poop, like that's completely fair. I have a whole troubleshooting section in the back because I don't want people to feel like 
loving and respecting pigeons means, you know, being knee deep in poop. Like it's totally okay to modify your balcony to make it less pigeon friendly, you know, or that kind of thing. I think that's, that's totally fair. You know, you don't, you, yeah. you don't have to go to an extreme. Although if you want to have them in your house, go for it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Lots of people do. It's very cute. And they use a little, is it called a flight suit or is it, it's basically a, a, a poopy pants, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, yeah, pigeon pants. If, pigeon if you pants, have, yeah. if you're ever bored, anyone who's listening, Google pigeon pants because there are pages and pages of images of basically these pigeon diapers, but they sort of have to wrap around the bird's wings. So they kind of come up. So they get decorated. And my favorite are there these formal wear ones that have like a little like ascot or like a little like cravat. And they're just like adorable. These little fancy pigeons with their diapers that are like this formal wear. Oh my God. It's, it's so, it's so wonderful. I love it. Pigeons in formal wear. So cute. Um, but let's talk, but can we talk, okay. Can we talk about pigeon poop? And it's, cause I think it's, I, this was really something very exciting to me. I did not know about uh, was its many uses, you know, back when they were useful to us, the poop was, was prime, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was a key reason why they were domesticated. They, um, I mean, I think probably the f- the first the first kind of inklings of domestication had to do partly with meat, but um, you can raise pigeons in these dove coats that will have you know thousands of birds in them, and then you get all this poop. And especially in areas um, in the Fertile Crescent, where you know in the Middle East where they were domesticated, there's going to be places where the soil needs a bit of nutrient influx. So you dump a bunch of pigeon poop on the soil, and you can raise, you know, like melons and cucumbers and all kinds of really wonderful stuff. So it was considered to be incredibly important. And then, um, then we realized that gunpowder could be made with three simple ingredients, one of which is saltpeter, which is in pigeon poop. So. Who knew? So, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I have, I have, yeah, I, I, can't, I've talked to my husband about this extensively at this point. That I was so, so, <laughs> so sorry. No, he was. I mean, at some point, he was like, "Okay, I think we're done talking about." This. But I was so excited by that. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 truly like it's really a shocking way to see it as valuable as opposed to like really, really gross stuff. But, but yeah, the, the, then we developed chemical based fertilizers and other ways of making gunpowder and we just, you know, totally forgot. And, you know, when I say we, I should, I should be careful because what I, what I did in the book was I tried not to lump everybody into these groups because, you know, this was, this was particular cultures in particular places. And for example, in North America, where these pigeons were not native, there was the passenger pigeon, which was really important to various indigenous groups and like colonists destroyed and installed yeah. their own pigeon. <laughs> so right. it's, it's, you know, there were, there were places where there were other pigeons that were actually the, the kings of pigeons. And, and I think probably the only reason why passenger pigeons weren't domesticated is because they migrated a lot. So mm. it's hard to d- domesticate a migratory animal, whereas the city pigeons, they just hang around. Yeah. 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 And uh, I sound like I'm poop obsessed here, but the third use, but I'm just thinking the third one is, is for curing leather, right? Yeah. For curing animal hides for leather, which, you know, this, yeah. Yeah. And there's places you can go in Morocco. I gather, I, I mean, I haven't been, I want to go so badly, but where you can see this happen and they still use pigeon poop and it's, wow. uh, it doesn't smell great, but it makes like, water, so yeah, it's, it's good stuff, I guess. Yeah. yeah. There are, um, so, I mean, such, such, it, I mean, so much information in, you know, a relatively, I don't know how you've done this, this, the size of the book, it's, it, it feels like you get so much amazing information information on uh, information on each page, including sort of the inside bits, which <laughs> well, took me so long to draw. Yeah, that was because the skeleton. Because I didn't want to just you know I, I didn't want to I wanted to come up with something original, not just copy it. So I was looking at three D images, rotating them, comparing them with different images. Yeah, wow, it, it took a lot to outstanding. No, it's outstanding. But I, uh, there's I just kept finding that every page I would learn something fascinating and one of the things that really got me uh was I I sort of considered myself a little bit of a bird nerd and I you know these ubiquitous sounds of the city one is that sort of clap 
that the pigeon does with its wings. And the other is, you know, you can, I mean, you can just even close it. You describe it so beautifully in the book, but if you close your eyes, you can hear it, this sort of whistle they make with the wing. Like, <laughs> yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. So what I didn't know is that was a form of communication. And that made me very excited because I love any time we get a window into a communication that's, you know, very blatant, except to our species, because we've closed ourselves off to it. So can you tell us about those, in particular, those two sounds? Because I thought it was amazing. Yeah, I thought that those were just the sounds pigeons made because they were bad at flying. <laughs> I, was say, I was like, oh, you hear a pigeon take off, you hear like clap, 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 whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. and I was like, oh, wow, they're, they're so bad at this. It's clumsy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, you know, sometimes you hear a duck take off and you're like, <laughs> I thought, oh, he's perfect. But no, it's intentional. So there was this, with the whistling sound, there was this really cool research that some scientists did where they identified this, like, part of the wing where they were pretty sure this was where the whistling sound was coming from. And they thought it was kind of like, it's sort of this, this ripply part that kind of deforms when, when, it, when they fly. And so... Um, it, it relies on kind of its flexibility. So what the scientists did was they grabbed some hairspray and they sprayed the wings of live pigeons just in that one particular spot. And then they released them and they no longer made the whistling sound. So the scientists were like, oh, so now we know where the whistling sound comes from. And they looked at some um, unrelated doves, uh, although pigeons and doves are are basically the same thing. They're in the same family. Um, and we can talk about that another time, but those doves also whistle when they take off. And if they, the scientists played the whistling sound to those doves, they all panicked and took off. So it's very probable that's what, what's going on with pigeons is they hear that sound and they think, oh, we all have to take off because there's a predator coming, which is so cool. It's not bad flying at all. It's like, you know, a siren or like, yes. someone's going like oh, we got to get out of here. Yes. And, and the clapping sound <laughs> has... <laughs> Two kind of it's it communicates two things depending on when it when it happens. So probably when pigeons, you know, first take off and a flock takes off and you hear that kind of thump, 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 that's their wings sort of clapping overhead. And it's probably also sort of a warning thing, like, hey, you know, something's up. But the males will also do it after a successful date. And they will basically fly back and forth between buildings or cliffs or, you know, wherever they are and clap for themselves in this sort of little display, like, yes, 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 yes. Clap, 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 clap. And we don't know why they do it, which I think is so funny. And the females don't do it. The females just sit there and they're just kind of like, there he goes. Bless him. We've all met those guys, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was trying not to draw too many parallels, but I just thought... Yeah. <laughs> it's so fun. It's so fun. Bravo. Bravo. I think it's I think it's so fascinating. And it it it's sort of a it reminds me also of um how recently we learned about hummingbird uh during the hummingbird courtship for the Anna's hummingbird. You know, they were listening to this sound that's it sounds very much like a whistle, like like this. And um, they only sort of fairly recently discovered the same thing. It's the, it's the sound of the tail feather. So just this idea that that communication is happening and, you know, we're getting to learn about it. And it just it makes me incredibly excited. Um, yeah, the clapping is that's hysterical. <laughs> but I can even think about times when I've heard those sounds and I can, I can remember, you know, that there was something that disturbed the pigeons, whether it was usually a, a child running around, you know, Trafalgar Square or something. Um, so it just, I don't know, it just sort of expands our understanding so much of these amazing birds. So cool. Yeah, I love the idea that you can kind of Sherlock your way through animal behavior and, you know, suddenly, suddenly your, your ears are more open to, you know, what's going on around you. And that, so that's what I was hoping to give people was that those kinds of clues that they can use to decode what's going on. So absolutely you do in spades. I tried to sneak it into my book, but yours is sort of, it's just so it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, so you do a beautiful job of that. I know we're not supposed to be talking, you know, all about your books all the time, but anyone who has not read hollow kingdom or feral creatures, they are so full of secret nature facts, but it's so seamless that you, <laughs> you don't realize. And then you're like, wait, now I know this thing about like Glaucus gulls or whatever. And it's, Thank it's you. Very... I mean, I, know that I feel like that's 
that's what, you know, I feel like you do that so beautifully because, you know, we need to know these things and it helps so much to have this much more, um, you know, I, it feels like the world gets bigger and the world gets more welcoming. And I feel like it sort of gives you a better experience of being human and being part of this incredible world. So of, of nature, I just think, yeah, you do it brilliantly. Um, there was, yeah, I mean, the whistles, the clapping, uh, the magnificent poop, all of these things were really, really exciting and really genuinely surprised me. Were there things that really surprised, because you probably came to your research already with a huge amount of pigeon knowledge. What was surprising to you during your research? I mean, some, it, like, I thought I knew more than I did when I started doing research because I didn't realize, I mean, I guess I, I hadn't fully understood how entwined we were with pigeons. Like I knew they'd been domesticated a while ago, but I didn't understand that it, it really, they really are like dogs or cats at this point with that equivalent amount of history. Um, and, and I, so I don't think I understood like how critically important they were to people up until recently. And totally unrelatedly, I did not know about the milk. And now I know about the milk and I sort of regret that I know about it. <laughs> but that was, yeah, that was, that was the weirdest thing I found. Do you want to, do you want to tell us a bit about the milk or do you want to leave the milk for the readers? How do you feel? <laughs> I'll, I'll share a frosty glass of that milk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick with water. Thanks. <laughs> so, right. So there are so many things about pigeons that are, um, familiar but alien which I think is what's so cool about birds in general so like birds for example they have four chambered hearts and we have four chambered hearts and they evolved independently like you know our like we basically converged on this similar thing and similarly male and female pigeons are both capable of producing milk for their offspring and like not only can they do it but those baby birds need it for the first few days like they like if you rescue a very young pigeon, you have to get it to a rehabilitator who can make milk basically for these, for these things. So they produce it in their throat because they, they don't have, you know, udders. Um, there's no little tiny <laughs> pigeon udders. <laughs> and they kind of like puke it into their kids' mouths or like regurgitate it. And it's cool because it's like so similar to mammalian milk. Like it's kind of chunkier than, you know, cow's milk or whatever, but it's got like fats and antioxidants and proteins and like helps with the immune system. And maybe the wildest thing is its production is stimulated by prolactin. So like if, if anyone listening is someone who lactates or, you know, knows someone who, who does, they would know prolactin, like it's this hormone that kicks in. And that's what also does it in the pigeons, but it was independently evolved. They just went like, this would be a great thing to do. And wow. that's wild to me is, that's, you know, yeah. yeah. How, so for the wildlife rehabilitators, are they, uh, what do, what do they give them? Is that uh, a similar or a, some kind I'm, of I'm not, they cook something up. Okay, okay. Uh, and, and it's not because you can't harvest pigeon milk. So they have to mix no. some things that have kind of a similar consistency. And I, I'm not really sure what all the ingredients are because thanks. Right, thankfully, right. I haven't had to yeah. engineer, <laughs> reverse yeah. engineer pigeon milk. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's really incredible. And you can't you can't give them seeds at that point. Like they need they need yeah. their milk. And both the male and female sit on the nest. Yeah. So you can't get much more nuclear family than a pigeon. Um, they mate for life, which a lot of birds do, but there's often a lot of cheating involved. I mean, we shouldn't call it cheating. It's, it's birds. They're doing their thing, yeah, yeah. but like, like pros, I like to say they're monogamish, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And there are really good reasons for that. I mean, some, yeah. some sparrows will have like a partner, but then they'll have like the handsome partner that <laughs> will um, we'll make handsome babies. And then they have oh, like, those sparrows. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're always kind of doing their own fun thing, but pigeons are weirdly faithful. Like they will sometimes have little divorces or they'll sometimes cheat, but for the most part, they are just smitten by their partner, like until one member of the partnership passes away and they split parental duties. So like the male will be on the nest for, you know, a certain part of the day. And then the female will be on the nest like overnight. And they're both just like, they really care for their, their babies and they'll have two 
kids at a time. Of course, they'll have roughly 13 per year. But, like, you know, other than that, it's like a weird parallel to kind of the ideal nuclear family, which is funny. It is. It is. God, it's so interesting. I was really also, I didn't know that the the part of the, the seer, is it called? The little fleshy bit there above and that the male has a larger seer than the female. That was fascinating to me. Yeah, it is hard to see, though. Um, it's, it's, it's like kind of a continuum. So it's almost impossible to tell a male from a female, but broadly on average, they've got a bigger one and we don't know what it's for. It's just kind of this this fleshy bump. You know, you see cartoons of a pigeon, you see a little fleshy bump and we don't know why they have that. Gosh, yes. Um, and yes, so they are this synanthropic species. They live alongside us, um, like quite a few interesting species. Um, what do you think that we can learn from living alongside uh, these feral birds? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I think the biggest lesson that sticks out to me is just how important it is to learn history, mm-hmm. because um, we have such slow or su- such um, we forget things so quickly, and and we have this sense that things have always been the way they've been. So when I was a kid, I thought, oh well, the pigeons clearly are from North America because they're, they're everywhere around me. And this is, this is how it's always been. And I didn't understand, you know, all the really cool history. And, you know, I didn't understand, you know, that there had been passenger pigeons and they were gone and all that stuff. So I think what, what looking at pigeons really teaches us is the importance of putting some kind of temporal context to all our wildlife observations and understanding, you know, change over time that, and just, boy, are they durable, I mean, I think if they can get through stuff, you know, we can get through stuff. They are like tough as nails birds. I mean, just a bunch of kittens that live out in the in the wild now and somehow survive. It's incredible. They're they're amazing. Yeah. 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 And and that's making me think of the the pigeon heroism of the world wars one and two, um, which is incredible. Yeah, heroism is, so I was talking to some wildlife rehabilitators yesterday. It's it's a tricky term because they yeah. didn't know <laughs> yeah. so I was yeah, up. <laughs> there's no pigeon who was standing on like a hill going like, oh boy. It's like <laughs> <laughs> and it's like dapper poopy pants. <laughs> I know, with like a little like, a little like, yeah, a little helmet. And, oh. Yeah, but, but so they, I mean, they served humans like to an, a ridiculous extent. So um, so if you carry a pigeon far away from its nest, it figures out how to get home through means that we don't totally understand. They're using like at least half a dozen different things. Science is still kind of working on it. But what's cool is if you strap something to that pigeon, like, you know, a message, the pigeon will carry it back to its nest. And so it can operate as like a one way message service. So um, in wars, you know, throughout history, but like, you know, most recently, World War One and World War Two, they were military techs. So soldiers would bring pigeons, you know, into battle. And then if something went wrong, they would release the pigeon, the pigeon would fly back to base with a note. And, you know, when you're in the trenches, there aren't a lot of easy ways to spread information. So these birds, you know, the most famous being Cher Ami was brought behind enemy lines um, in France by these American soldiers. And, and, and then they fell under friendly fire. They released Cher Ami. Cher Ami um, sustained some pretty gruesome <laughs> wounds, but made it back to base, survived, and saved the lives of, you know, dozens and dozens of soldiers, and, you know, received a medal, is stuffed in the Smithsonian, you can go visit Cherami. It's, like, incredible how they were really considered, like, you know, important animals for a while. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. It's amazing to think of it, and you're right, it is kind of (laughs) reluctant heroism, isn't it? forced heroism maybe <laughs> yeah I mean they do love people like they really you know we we go like ooh, why are there pigeons around us and it's like oh they want to be around us like this is like their sweet spot is like where we are and we're dropping food and we're making little warm houses they can climb into like this is yeah they yeah. want to be around us yeah I and, and speaking of around us it, it makes me think of um you 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 talk a little bit about stringfoot um, and the Stringfoot Saviors. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because that was that's a shocking 
that that's a, the cause of it I find is quite interesting. Yeah, um, it's a little complicated. So pigeons have messed up feet a lot and there, there doesn't seem to be one particular cause, but um, one of the reasons why we all think pigeons are gross or a lot of people do is that they walk around on the ground when they forage. So they don't like fly through the trees and perch. They're not perching birds really. They'll hang out in trees sometimes, but they shuffle along the ground. So their feet get hurt by whatever stuff we throw on the ground. You know, like imagine walking in the ground and barefoot in the city, it's kind of dangerous. So they're probably getting injured that way. But also there seems to be this thing that happens where they get like string or hair or something wrapped around a digit and it cuts off circulation and then they lose a toe. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've rescued pigeons that have bad string foot and like, or at least one that I can think of and taken it to a wildlife rehabilitator. But there mm -hmm. are people who just do this. They're like gorilla string foot Facebook communities and they, they catch pigeons and snip off the string foot and release the pigeon. And it's so interesting that there are people who care that much about this one particular in injury in one particular bird. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, they, they, yeah, they go out there and, and do this thing. It's, it's pretty cool. Humans yeah. are weird. It's <laughs> great. It, and it's funny too that we, you know, there we are saying, ew, you know, pigeons are dirty and it's our hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's dirty. A person. Yeah. 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 I actually know someone who does that, who's a string savior. And um, uh, she's a young lady and uh, a teenager. And I'm, I just didn't know it was a thing until I started seeing videos of her um, and, and she's amazing. She goes and captures them and is very stealthy and gentle and releases them as soon as she's, you know, removed the hair. But but who knew that was happening? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the interactions of people and pigeons, I think, are the coolest thing about pigeons. It's, that's mm -hmm. so sweet, though. Good for her. I know. I know. And they're intelligent. They're highly intelligent. So I'm, from these, you have a brilliant list, a brilliant, it's a pretty bizarre list. <laughs> of things that we have kind of trained them to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you yeah, I mean, they're not, so So the star of your book is a crow who, um, I mean, there are a few stars, but it's mostly it's mostly the crow. And, and they are like incredibly smart. And I mean, I think you reflect that really well. You know, they're natural animals and they're not, they don't have human smarts, but um, they're, they're, they're really, really clever and crafty. And, you know, you've had, you've posted videos of, of you and your like local crows. Pigeons are not crows, so they're not quite there, um, but they're so much smarter than I thought they were. So in the lab, um, we've trained them to play ping pong. Um, I think my favorite was they can distinguish impressionist from cubist paintings, although they can't tell if a cubist painting is hung the right way up, if you flip it upside down, they're just like, whatever, it's a cubist painting, which I think, which I really empathize with. Sometimes it's like, to be fair, I probably couldn't either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like That's cool art. Which way does it go? Yeah. And, and other stuff, I mean, they, they can um, tell cancerous from non-cancerous tissue samples on slides. Like it's incredible. At the same time, if you swap a pigeon's babies with someone else's babies, they're just like, oh, there's some babies, guess I'll feed them. Like, you know, it's it's a very like particular intelligence that's really visual, like, cause mm -hmm. they, they have to find their way home. And so their, their visual acuity is just off the charts. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah. And potentially reading the earth's magnetic field. Um, yeah, I was hoping to find more conclusive stuff about that. And I found a bunch of arguments among scientists where some of them thought they'd found the magnetic part of the, the pigeon. And then it turns out that was just sort of like a, a blood iron thing. And, and um, some people say, well, for sure they have magnetic sense. And some people are like, oh, they're relying more on their smell. And it was so interesting. It's a whole like complicated debate. So there's still mysteries about pigeons that we can we can figure out which is really cool good because then we can have a second book <laughs> <laughs> um i think one of the most fun things too is looking through some of the breeds of pigeons that are out there um and that you know we have sort of um brought into being and some of them are it's just exquisite do you have a favorite 
Yes. <laughs> I 100% have a favorite. I shouldn't pick favorites. There's there's no. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. That's true. Um, yeah. So it is so funny. Um, we all know, you know, Chihuahuas or Great Danes or Persian cats or Siamese cats or whatever, but um, there are all these pigeon breeds. And because pigeons aren't as big nowadays, most people don't know about, you know, the Scandaroon or the Saxon fairy swallow or the Hungarian giant house pigeon, you know, all these <laughs> names. But I think my favorite is the Archangel or, or Archangel. I, I've never known how to say that word, but it's this breed that, um, so basically pigeon breeders pick a trait and make that trait go wild. And so, you know, my favorite part of a pigeon is probably the, their glossy neck. It's so pretty. Mm. So the archangel has that gloss, but all over its body. So um, they come in a few different um, different colors and 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 it's complicated because in Germany they have some of them have a different name. Anyway, but they they are just like dripping with shininess. Like they're just like like copper and and emerald and they're like and if you google them you will see they just look like royalty like they're so they're so pretty so I really want a coop of those guys because they're would you want would you want a, a your own dove coat I would love I mean I would especially love to like rescue pigeons because there's yeah, all yeah. these great great pigeon rescues like if you want a pet pigeon they're everywhere there's Palomacy there's I think a Great Lakes pigeon rescue they're all over um, I don't have the space. I have two parrots. If I added another bird, I think my apartment would explode <laughs> because there's just no space. <laughs> I would love to have um, a dove coat though someday. My dream is like a like a country, you know, like like pigeon pigeon coat or something. Although I'd probably not let them fly around wild because they get eaten by peregrine falcons and stuff. But. Yes, yes, yes. I think that would be risky. Um, I. I particularly like the the Nicobar uh, pigeon, who also has that gorgeous shininess. Um, yeah, and I had an experience at the they have them at the Woodland Park Zoo, and when I was there one time, they the pair were building a nest, and one of them kept selecting twigs and then walking past me very slowly, very clearly brandishing the twig. <laughs> Look at this. And I just, I was so enamored of, you know, the physical beauty of this pigeon, but also this, you know, classic bird move of, you know, showing off all but clapping its wings for itself. <laughs> yeah. So Nicobar pigeons. So um, I, I have a few sections where I talk about like other members of the, of the pigeon family and they are for sure my favorite, like other, other pigeon. They're other pigeon. so they're gorgeous and their ecological role is that they shuffle around on the ground eating the poop of other fruit fruit pigeons that are up in the trees because they can digest some of the harder seeds. So of course okay. they're pigeons, so there's like a poop angle with like every single one of these birds. It's so funny. <laughs> and I I think the Jacobin should get a mention too, who looks like a I mean, straight out of an Agatha Christie novel, really, you know, this sort of fabulous cowl of feathers it's incredible it's just gorgeous gorgeous all these different types that we just don't see these pigeons we yeah I showed someone a picture of a Jacobin or Jacobin I again I'm not sure the right way to pronounce it but I I and they said oh that's that pigeon is a rich divorcee <laughs> you got it yeah they so they have Backwards pointing feathers, but the with this breed, they wrap all around the head except just the head is sticking out. So it's like a this feather boa. And they actually can't um successfully breed and, and raise young with that hood. So painlessly the breeder will like trim that hood. So then they can, you know, they take their, their boa off and then they can raise their young and then the boa grows back, which is just like wow. That's so a, that makes them sort of the French bulldogs of the you know pigeon world, doesn't it? <laughs> And, and this will probably not surprise you, but Queen Victoria loved her Jacobin pigeons. That's really like on brand. Yeah, that, that is very on brand. <laughs> um, will So will there be more pocket guides? Or do you think you'd do more of these wonderful? What are your thoughts? Because this must, uh, and how long did this take you? This must have been such a labor of love to figure out how long because you know books are always kind of like you talk about them and then you work a little bit and then something changes and whatever but it's been a few years 
Yeah. Um, if, you know, please, please buy a pocket guide to pigeon watching, because the more you buy, the more my publisher is like, oh yes, do whatever you want. Yes. <laughs> um, it's the but, perfect stock, stocking stuffer, I must say. <laughs> it's, it's the right, yeah, it's the right size. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would love, like, I would love to write about, um, house, house sparrows, I think would be mm. so fun yes. because they're also not native to here. They're European and they were brought over pure. They are not useful for anything. They were brought over because Europeans were like, you know what the Americas is lacking is a truly refined, you know, pastoral bird that sings a beautiful song. And the house sparrows, I mean, you know their song, right? It's like, <laughs> chirp. <laughs> Meanwhile, we literally have a song sparrow is yes. native to here and sounds beautiful. But these these folks were like, no, no, we have to bring these over to like civilize the Americas. Oh, that's so silly. And they're you aggressive, know. aren't they, to other birds? They will um, off another bird, won't they? If they're, you know, sometimes quite territorial. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did, did, did they yeah. also, aren't they, was it house sparrows that first used uh, cigarette butts in the lining of their nest? Oh, I mean, I've heard other birds doing that, but yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. I think, I mean, I, this is a while ago I was reading about it, but I think it's, it's, it's definitely a sparrow, but I don't know which sparrow, but line the, you know, used it basically to ward off insects, which is crazy. It's so fascinating. Uh, um, yeah, that is cool. I, I have to look that up. That's like, uh, yeah, that's such a that's such an Anthropocene thing. <laughs> they're like, oh, we're going to use this is. toxic chemical. It's a bit depressing. <laughs> yeah, and they're definitely, yeah, house sparrows have an impact on some native species. Although, again, they tend to stick closer to us, but they, they can definitely, I mean, they will murder other birds. What's weird about pigeons is they don't really. Like, they right. kind of they're not really invasive. Like they're, they, they're anywhere we are, they drive us crazy, but, uh, and there's a few exceptions. Like they can sometimes potentially spread diseases to rare native birds. And, you know, we have to keep an eye out for that, but for the most part, they, they just want to be right where we are and that's it. It's quite lovely. It's quite lovely. Um, if anybody has any questions while we have, while we're so lucky to have Rosemary here, please, you know, dive in with those. Um, I'm seeing, uh, one here. Um, I'm interested in how pigeons and doves don't seem to care about things around their nests. We have morning doves who nest above our back door and they don't care about our movements or lights at night. Yeah, they're notorious for being bad at this. <laughs> pigeons, all pigeons and doves, maybe not all pigeons and doves. They're not, they're not great Okay, how do I say this? Um, <laughs> You're being there, diplomatic. <laughs> there are birds that make really spectacular nests, and then there are pigeons and doves. Morning doves are a native, um, a native pigeon species or native dove species, and they, um, they just, I mean, I've seen just the most ridiculous excuses for nests from them. Um, they're famous for, you know, when they do build a nest in a tree, it'll be pretty teetering and, you know, the wind blows and the nest falls down and they just keep, they basically just keep throwing something at the wall until it sticks. Like they're so like, I had a friend text me, like something is building a nest in a crate on my back step, right where I go outside. And I was like, morning dove. And they're like, how do you know? <laughs> but, but yeah, they're, they're not great at it. I mean, pigeons notoriously are, are kind of haphazard, but it's because they nest on flat surfaces. So all they really need to do is put down a couple twigs and an, an egg. They don't need to worry about building like a beautiful, beautiful cup. They're, they're not. So no. yeah, that, that morning doves are like that. Um, they do lose a lot of chicks, but they just keep having them till some of them survive. So yeah. No. They're My parents to. have a swifts that are um, building and, and every year build, tried to build right outside there where they're living. And it just invariably, they're not doing a great job. It's not uh, coming together for them. So uh, my poor dad has been, you know, trying to think about 3D printing and <laughs> nest. <for them. laughs> like, this is how you do it. <laughs> it's a little model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of birds for the first few years, it, their nests fail because they're still kind of figuring out how to do it, um, yeah. which, is, which is funny. Like experience really counts for birds. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Sort of like authors writing lots of books and then getting some of them rejected and then, you know, eventually. Yes, those Uh, early books. (laughs) They are a lot like failed nests. (laughs) Yeah. Well, speaking of which, I mean, not failed books, but um, are you allowed to talk about any upcoming projects or are you? Uh, Yeah, I mean, yes, I am. I'm I'm working on something now that is, um, I I don't really know how to describe it. It sounds insane. So I'll just tell you it's funny fantasy. Um, And it is a conflation of really strange things. And it's very nature forward, of course. Um, And uh, it's it's a tough one, this one. I I once heard someone say that writing a novel is like wrestling an octopus into a jar. Um, which I, I I don't love for the because I love cephalopods and hate the idea of someone putting one in a jar. But I do think it's a very nice visual metaphor and is a little bit of what I'm experiencing. <laughs> so yeah, it is a, it's an interesting one, but it's coming together. I'm, I'm in the editing stage. Oh, yeah, oh, I'm excited to read that. That sounds yeah yeah. Your books are like tailor made for me. Like wow. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, I'm well, I feel exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. Are you are are you able to talk about what's next? Yeah, I've got. Um, let's see. So I've got two that I can talk about that are coming out next year. There's a picture book called "Flowers Are Pretty Weird," which is about yes. it's a follow up to a book called "Butterflies Are Pretty Gross." That's just about how these things are a lot stranger than you would think. Um, And then I have one called Expedition Backyard that's a graphic novel for young readers about exploring your backyard. And there are pigeons because I don't think I can't give them up. I love them so much. (laughs) Mustn't. We are here for more pigeons and more pigeons like you've you've, I feel like you've written you've opened the gateway to pigeon love. (laughs) It's great. That's a great note to to end on. I want to just thank you both so much, Rosemary and Kara. This is is such a delightful conversation, as I knew it would be. And we can't wait to have you guys back, maybe in person, for your upcoming books. And I just would like to encourage all our viewers and listeners to please support um, Rosemary by purchasing the book. There. As we held it up earlier, there we go. Pigeon watching, perfect size, perfect stacking size. Oh, I and forgot to show you. I did fake fake pigeon tattoos. Oh, I completely so forgot to, to, I to saw celebrate those earlier, and I was gonna. Yeah. I was <laughs> gonna so comment. I was so excited, but I, I wasn't sure they were pigeons. <laughs> no, it's That's hard to so tell. cool. Oh. Yes, they are. They're pigeons in honor of your brilliant book. Yes. Oh, awesome. Pigeon love. Pigeon love. <laughs> yeah. So we do, we have these available at uh, our store. We have both our stores open, Book Passage Ferry Building in San Francisco, Book Passage Corte Madera, our main store. You can always call the store or uh, go to our website, bookpassage.com, order them through there. Um, get them for our, all your bird loving friends for the holidays. And we are suggesting to people because of supply chain to order early every Everything is is here for now, but we don't know about tomorrow. So we definitely suggest that um, you shop early. Uh, and um, a couple things, if you're interested in some special programs, we have great holiday programs at Book Passage, including our Giving Tree program, which you can donate to provide books for um, disadvantaged and um, uh, kids and adults who don't get books, some who never have owned a book in their life, we like to provide that for them. Um, You can donate to that as well. We also have some great programs for book lovers. uh, It's kind of like a book of the month. It is our first editions club. And then we also have personalized um, shopping, which you can get a subscription and have uh, a special book sent to a loved one as often as you'd like, once a week, once a month, um, every six months. So um, go online, look at some of our great programs, buy many of these books, and stay safe, everybody, and have a wonderful holiday. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you so much. It was so good to see you, Kira. And yeah, thank you, Allison. Please shop at Book Passage, local bookstores. That's where your Christmas presents are coming from this year. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. (laughs) 